But today we want to talk about uh, Japan versus China. I've shown you this image before. This is the imperial family of Japan, the Meiji family. This picture was taken in the 1800s. And the beginning um, of the, the early part of the Meiji era, which lasted up until 1911, was the major turning point in modern Japan. And our guide yesterday made reference to it. In fact, a lot of our guides in Japan have made reference to the Meiji Restoration because that was the, the corner that Japan turned from being a, a very traditional, um, very non-advanced, if you will, um, country to being the, the very modern power that first led to the Second World War uh, in the Pacific and then later on to the modern technological giant that it became later on. As I mentioned, as I pointed out before, you will notice this picture from the 1880s. The adults in this picture are all wearing what would have been Western clothing from that time period. The children are still wearing traditional clothes, but the adults are wearing a modern clothing. And this is reflective of the fact that the Meiji uh, emperor is the one who led the way to uh, Japan becoming a modern, very much westernized uh, manufacturing power. So I want to talk a little bit about that history, how we got there. In 1603, the third dynasty of shoguns began. It started in the late 1100s, but in 1603, the Tokugawa shogunate began. And that the shogun, again, if you missed the earlier lectures, was the military ruler of Japan for about 700 years, from the late 1100s to the 1860s. And they, the emperor was just a figurehead. He had no real power. It was the shogun, the generalissimo of Japan, that ran everything. So in 1603, uh, a new dynasty of shogun came in, the Tokugawa shogun. And uh, during that period of time, there were Westerners coming in. And particularly, there were Westerners who were coming in that were arguing with one another. Um, there had been an, an influence by Francis Xavier, and the Catholic Church had come in. and um, there were quite a few Catholics at that point in Japan. And then, because the 1500s was when the Protestant Reformation happened, then we got some fairly enthusiastic uh, Dutch and others who came in who were saying, oh, no, no, that's not true. Those people are lying to you. You don't believe that. And eventually, the Tokugawa Shogun decided he could not trust Westerners. And so in the 1620s, he declared that Japan was going to isolate itself from the rest of the world. This was called the period of the Sukuru, uh, meaning isolation. And so from that, uh, from 1620s up until the mid 1800s, a period of about 220 years, Japan was cut off from the rest of the world. No Japanese commoners, there were a few uh, government officials that would travel out, but no commoners were allowed to leave Japan and no Westerners were allowed to come into Japan. The one exception was that some Dutch and Portuguese at different times uh, traded at the Jima Island in Nagasaki, but that was the only place they were allowed to come, nowhere else in, in Japan. Well, in 1853, the Americans, being brusque as we are, uh, Matthew Commodore Perry came into the harbor, uh, Edo Harbor, which is Tokyo Harbor, where we uh, started out our trip, Yokohama, and came into the harbor with uh, four gunships and demonstrated the power of his gunships and wanted to meet with the emperor, had a letter from the US president saying, we want to trade with you. Well, he met with the shogun and because we didn't even know that they were isolated, that's how isolated they were. We did not know that the emperor was not running the country. And so um, he made it very clear, Matthew, Matthew Perry made it very clear that we are anxious to trade with Japan. We're an anxious to have a government ambassador here. And if you don't allow us to, then we will use those gunships out there to convince you. Well, he said, I'll be back in a year. He came back six months later with seven gunships. And at that point, the Tokugawa uh, Shogun, who was a military man after all, recognized that um, the military force that was confronting him was something that they weren't prepared to deal with because they had been isolated for over 200 years. They had nothing approaching the kind of weaponry that the Americans or any of the major Western powers had. And so he agreed to open the borders for trade with the United States. Well, shortly after that, a lot of the other daimyos, the clan lords, uh, the sort of right below the shogun, they were clan lords over all the clans in Japan, they decided that this was a sh real show of weakness. 
and that the, Togun, uh, the Tokugawa shogun needed to be replaced. And so in 1866, two of the major daimyos from the south, uh, two of the strongest clans, Satsuma and Chosun, led a revolt against the shogun and threw him out of power. And this is called the Meiji Restoration because that was the point at which the emperor was restored to his full authority. Um, and so for two years they fought a, a war, the Boshin War, from 1866 to 1868, at the end of which the Tokugawa shogun was thrown out, the Meiji Emperor was reinstalled as being the, the real authority, not just the figurehead in Japan. Well, this gentleman, the Meiji Emperor, had was very struck by the fact that the Japan was so clearly behind the Western world. They hadn't even been fully aware of it until uh, Commodore Perry came into Edo Harbor. So he determined that Japan was going to radically change, that they were going to become a manufacturing nation, they were going to develop their industry, they were going to develop a modern military. To, and very simply, the goal was to be an equal to any of the powers of uh, the West, the United States or Western Europe. And so they started a process over the next 30 years or so in which the change was astonishing in what all happened. Now, some of it was very difficult. It was really socially traumatic because um, just a few years after he was re reinstalled in the restoration process, the emperor got rid of the feudal system, which means he got rid of the samurai. He demoted the daimyos. Um, he had a conscription army, a modern conscription army, and many, many other changes were, were made. Some of them, uh, like universal education, we would obviously applaud, but it was very difficult. And in fact, there was a rebellion, the Satsuma Rebellion, against the emperor because of those changes. That's what the movie The Last uh, Samurai is all about, is the rebellion against the emperor. Uh, that, that movie's probably 70% accurate. Um, the part about the emperor being a weak, um, you know, teenager that everybody was pushing around was not true of the Meiji Emperor. He was actually the one calling the shots there. But um, the, the problem that they had was when the Emperor decided we're going to modernize, we're going to become a modern uh, Western nation with a powerful military, they did not have the resources to do that. They had a little bit of iron in the very southern part of Japan, but they had no coal, they had no oil, and they didn't have enough iron to really start a steel industry. It's very hard to make weapons for a modern military if you don't have the ability to make steel. And so, Japan started looking around at the various places they could get this stuff. They traded for what they could, but they also noticed that the Western powers had a very, a very distinct approach to getting the resources that they wanted from weaker countries, and that was they would just take them. Yeah, that's why you have so many British colonies, why you have so many, uh, you know, there were French colonies, Belgian colonies, uh, Dutch colonies all over the world. Because they would come in and, and were more, more powerful and they would simply either declare that this is now part of our empire or they would start an extractive process where they would take the resources they want. This had happened in China in the uh, two opium wars in the 1800s and Japan has see is seeing all of this and so they decided that if they can do that, why shouldn't we? Great Britain had defeated China twice in the 1800s in the Opium Wars, and then in 1901, eight different uh, powers sent troops into China to, to stop the Boxer Rebellion. I'm gonna do a talk about the Opium Wars and the Boxer Rebellion as we go along as well. This is why the British from the Opium Wars had control of Hong Kong until very recently, and Kowloon, which is the coastal area around Hong Kong, it's why if you go to Qingdao in China today, um, it's German. Half the city is called Germantown, and the number one beer in China, Qingdao beer, is, uh, was built by German brewers. And so, because they were given that, you know, they really took that port as their control. So, um, for all of this, China had been trying to modernize as well. This was the time of the Qing Empire in China. It's the last dynastic empire. It lasted until 1911, and then in, uh, the, when the emperor stepped down, Emperor Puyi, and then in 1912, the uh, Republic of China was declared. Later on, there's a civil war. I'm gonna talk about that too. 
um, all the things you're going to know by the time you finish this cruise. So the, the Qing Empire at, at that point had been defeated several times to the extent that the Qing, that's why the Qing Empire ended up being the last dynastic empire in China is because they, could, they were not successful in modernizing, they were not successful in, in really maintaining themselves as a, as a power. They had always been understood to be the power of East Asia was China. Well, Japan looks over here, and the closest place that they could get the resources that they really needed was Korea, because Korea had those things. Even more so, uh, um, this area that connects or is just beyond Korea in China, the Manchurian area, was very rich in a lot of the things that, that Japan needed. And so um, Japan started looking with great longing at first Korea, but then also the possibility of taking resources from China in Manchuria. So at this point, Korea had been primarily controlled. They were an independent country, but they really were a tribute nation to, to China. China called the shots. Well, Japan started getting actively involved in diplomatic relations with uh, Korea. In 1875-76, they convinced Korea to open themselves to trade with other countries besides just China, which the Chinese did not appreciate. And so through the period of the 1870s, 1880s, and 90s, there ended up being this tug of war between China and Japan over Korea. And both of them sent legations, that is diplomatic uh, missions, and in Korea they ended up with two parties. One side supported maintaining their, their long-time relationship with China as their primary partner. The other side, who were tired, tired of the Chinese and did not see them as very valuable anymore, and saw the modernizing efforts of Japan, they wanted to go with Japan. And what that meant was that there was a very strong conflict between China and uh, Japan over Korea during this time, but particularly that there were various parties within Korea itself that were fighting over this issue. What happened then is that we there were various flare-ups that happened until finally, in the um, late 1880s, we had a group of pro-Chinese, anti-Japanese partisans, if you will, that attacked the Japanese legation, their, their embassy, in Korea. They killed one military advisor and they drove the others off. These two images represent that. They chased them out um, and the, this image below here is the Japanese legation ended up having to flee in a small fishing boat and had to be rescued by a Japanese ship after that. Well, later on, the Koreans were forced to pay reparation for this and to apologize for it, and it really, it kind of upped the ante uh, on this disagreement between China and Japan over Korea, but it also meant that the Japan was all the more uh, committed to making J uh, Korea the source of what they needed. Well, in the conflict back and forth between the Chinese and the Japanese eventually led to a convention called the Lee Ito Convention, in which they both agreed that they would leave the country and uh, leave the country of Korea and they would not send troops back in there without getting approval from the other side. That was fine until 1894 when Korea experienced a rebellion, the Tongak Rebellion, and because of their long history of relying on China, probably without even thinking about it, the, the uh, king of Korea asked China to come in and help with this rebellion, so China sent troops. Well, Japan considered that a violation of the treaty, and so Japan sent troops in. That led to further conflict until August 1st of 1894, in which China and Japan declared war against one another. This is the first Sino-Japanese War. Um, this image on the left is a modern image. You'll notice North Korea, South Korea, etc. But I'm putting this up here because it, it very clearly shows there is a little thumb of Manchuria from China. This is called the Laitong Peninsula, and it reaches down into the Bohai Sea um, here. This was a very strategic area. Well, when, um, and I'll talk about that. When Japan and China went to war, no one expected Japan to win. China had always been the traditional power in East Asia. They had the largest army, but they had not been successful in modernizing. Japan had been very successful in modernizing. And so what happened is, in six months, 
the Japanese defeated China. And everybody, with the possible exception of Japan, were just astonished by this. No one could believe that little Japan, which is how everybody still thought of them, could defeat the giant China. Um, particularly, as is reflected here, Japan crossed over the Tsushima Straits here, marched up through Korea, and then down into the Laitong Peninsula. They took Port Arthur, which was a major port, and then crossed over. They also ended up uh, down in Taiwan. Well, when they won this war against China, six months later, China sued for peace because they were being just destroyed by the Japanese Army and Navy. The Chinese gave um, the rights to trade in Korea to the Japanese. They also gave them the, uh, the island of Taiwan and the Pescadores Islands. They gave them control of the Laitong Peninsula. And so everything that, that Japan had wanted were given to them from this war. These are two images from that time which make it pretty clear why the Japanese won. These are Japanese soldiers from that period of time. And we, we went to one place recently where they were in period costumes. Um, and one of them was dressed like this because that was what during the during this time period that's what the Japanese uniforms look like well down here on the left if you can see it there are these are the the uh, Chinese soldiers they're still wearing very traditional gear many of them were still fighting with swords and bows and arrows and the Japanese had purchased battleships from France and guns from from the United States and Western Europe and they were very well equipped and so you get the Chinese defending fortresses and things, and the Japanese having cannon and just, you know, running roughshod over the Chinese armies. And so this was the defeat of China in the first war. Unfortunately for, um, and, and this kind of reflects it, this was a cartoon at that time of little Japan standing on the chest of, of big China. The China's defeat was a very hard blow for China after being defeated twice by the British in the Opium Wars and then having the Boxer Rebellion come up right after this in 19, 19, um, 1899 to 1901, in which other powers came in and put down a rebellion in China. And this led to the fall of the last emperor and the fall of the imperial dynasties in China in 1911. Well, at this point, with the Japanese having won the war, Korea declared complete independence from China and came under the control of the Japanese. At first, the Japanese uh, being in control, their influence seemed very positive. They got rid of slavery in Korea. There were no special class privileges. There was equality of law and opportunity. There was universal education, no more child marriages, etc. But eventually, as I'll talk about in the next few days, uh, when we talk about Korea, they ended up turning Korea into a colony and tried to very intentionally destroy Korean history and language and culture. The Koreans were forced by the Japanese to speak Japanese and no one was allowed to speak Korean. They were not allowed to study Korean history in the schools. They had to study Japanese history. They were even forcing the Koreans to attend Shinto, Shinto religious services uh, and to take on uh, Japanese names instead of Korean names. And so. Uh, it ended up being very, very difficult time, the colonial time, when, they were, uh, when Korea was a colony of Japan. But for all of this, Japan still had won the war. They had control of the resources in Korea and the Laitong Peninsula in um, Manchuria in China. But I should have shown you this earlier. <coughs> you will notice up here Russia and Vladivostok which is, was the main port of the Pacific Fleet of Russia. This is before it was the Soviet Union, of course. Well, the problem that the Russians had is Vladivostok is not a warm water port. In other words, it freezes up in the wintertime, which meant in the winter, the Russian fleet couldn't get in and out of their only port on the Pacific that was usable. And they actually had taken that away from China a number of years before that, at the, um, during some of the problems of uh, the 19th century. So the Russians wanted a warm water port, one that they could use all the time. And they looked down here, this area, the Bohai Sea and Yellow Sea, does not freeze up in the wintertime. So the Russians were looking with great ambition and um, envy on this Laitong Peninsula. So they convinced Germany, Russia convinced Germany and France to back them in pressuring 
the Japanese not to take over the Laikung Peninsula, even though Ch uh, China had given them control of it when they won the war. And so uh, this became a huge pressure. Russia not only, um, and, and Japan had to say yes, because they were not in a position to fight three major Western powers. You know, if it was gonna be Russia, Germany, and France, they were not so silly as to think they could take all three of them on at one time. And so they backed off the Laikung Peninsula. They were fully prepared, Japan was fully prepared to say, give us control of uh, all of the Korean Peninsula and we will let you alone in terms of you working in Manchuria. Well, after the, the, but the Russians wouldn't even talk to them. The Russians insisted not only on taking over the Laikung Peninsula and part of Manchuria, but also they insisted on controlling the northern part of the Korean Peninsula down to the 39th parallel. Of course, later on the 38th parallel would become very important. Um, and they wouldn't even talk to the Japanese. The Japanese kept trying to negotiate with them. Uh, Tsar Nicholas II called the Japanese those little yellow monkeys. He clearly was racist. He believed that the Russians were racially superior, that their military was far superior, and that he could tell the Japanese to do whatever he wanted. They would have to do it. If he didn't, he would just whip them. And so you ended up with this conflict growing and growing between Japan and Russia and Russia wouldn't even talk to them about it. So eventually, and by the way, the Laikung Peninsula, that thumb that sticks down in the Bohai Sea, after uh, really pressuring the Japanese not to move in there, they then signed a lease with China to take over the, the Laikung Peninsula for 25 years, 25 year lease, and they built their port at a place called Port Arthur. It's now called Lushan, it's the city of Lushan now. But Port Arthur, now was the major naval base for the Pacific Fleet of the Russian Navy. Um, and of course, Japan is just furious over this, and they're also uh, upset because they won't even talk to them about it. So as the pressure begins to grow between Japan and Russia, this is the kind of propaganda that was showing up in Russia, where a Russian ship, a sailor on a Russian ship is punching a, a, a Japanese sailor, they're, um, a Cossack is whipping or looking down like they're a little dog or picking them up and shaking them. The Russians thought, who are these little people trying to tell us what to do or, or trying to force us to even negotiate with them? Well, um, this went on long enough that Japan knew that they had to act. In 1902, Japan signed a mutual defense treaty with Great Britain. That was key because that meant that France and Germany and other Western powers had to stay out of it. Because if they got involved in a war against Japan on Russia's behalf, then the Great Britain would be involved in the war. This, by the way, is the kind of tactic that got us into the First World War, you know, these, these promises of mutual defense. But at that point, uh, Japan didn't have any fear that other, other forces were gonna come in on the side of Russia. And so from 1904 to 1905, we have what's been called the most important forgotten war in history, which is the Russo-Japanese War. And in that war, the first thing that happened um, is that Japan launched a surprise attack against the Russian port, Port Arthur. Sound familiar? Surprise <laughs> attack. Using many subs and torpedo boats, they attacked the uh, Port Arthur is right here, right at the end of the Laitong Peninsula. And so the Japanese attacked there, they sank uh, battleships, did major damage, and then retreated out of the port um, because they were using small vessels. They, they mined outside the port so that the Russians, when they tried to leave with some of their weapons in order to respond uh, with naval force, which is all they really had there, they, uh, one of their other battleships was sunk, another one was severely damaged, and the primary commanding officer, the, an admiral, uh, was killed. When they, when they struck these mines. Well, at that point, they're in a deadlock. Japan cannot attack into the port because in addition to the, the ships, the Russians had guns all along the ridges above the port and they could fire down on any ships that tried to come into the port. So the Japanese couldn't come in, but the Russians couldn't come out. And because of the mining and because they were, they, the Japanese were waiting for them. And so what the Japanese did at this deadlock they, once again, crossed over to Korea. They marched up through Korea and had several battles with the, um, the Russians. And in almost every case, the Japanese were victorious. The Russian generals, the military leaders, had the same attitude that Tsar Nicholas did. They didn't take the Japanese seriously, and so they were being defeated in almost every battle. 
But the Japanese then crossed over and came down the Laitong Peninsula and came in behind Port Arthur. They attacked the hill uh, emplacements, the gun emplacements above Port Arthur from the land side, defeated the Russians there eventually. I mean, I say defeated, they lost, uh, they had 500,000 Japanese casualties in this war. Um, and that was important too because later on the Japanese felt like they had earned a right to control Manchuria because of the amount of blood they had spilled there. Well, they came in behind uh, Port Arthur took over some of the gun emplacements, and that then meant they could fire down on the Russian ships in that port. And between that and the Russian, the uh, Japanese Navy outside the port, they destroyed the whole fleet. The entire Pacific fleet of the Russians was destroyed. Um, at that point, because the, the admiral who was in charge of Port Arthur had been killed earlier, there was a general, uh, General Major General um, Antoli Stessel, and this was a port. The purpose of the port was to have the fleet. The fleet was now gone. It had all been destroyed. So he surrenders, much to the amazement of the Japanese and much to the chagrin of Tsar Nicholas and the other military, because uh, he didn't ask permission to do this. Well, he later on was tried in absentia in, in, uh, for treason, was uh, condemned to be executed, but later on they, they uh, change that. They didn't actually end up executing for it. But this is how traumatic this was to the Russians. So traumatic, in fact, that Tsar Nicholas was not going to take it laying down. So the um, this is Japan, Korea, and Vladivostok is up here. So the entire Russian Pacific fleet is now gone. Well, Russia had three fleets. They were one of the largest navies in the world. And they had a fleet in the Black Sea and a fleet in the Baltic Sea. The Black Sea um, fleet was kind of limited because the, the other countries around the Mediterranean didn't like seeing the Russian fleet going in and out too much. So he called on the Baltic fleet to come to Japan. Now, because of a conflict between Russia and Britain, uh, the British would not let them use the Suez Canal, which meant the Russian Baltic fleet had to go all the way around Africa it's a seven month journey, you know, halfway around the world practically. And uh, during this whole time, and, and you know, Tsar Nicholas is just waiting until his fleet gets there to show these Japanese what for. Well, as they approach, the Japanese had very good intelligence. They knew where the Russian fleet was the whole time. And as they come up here, the Russian fleet makes the decision to sail up through the Tsushima Straits between Japan and Korea. The Japanese were waiting for them, and as the Russians, in a straight line, are sailing up the Tsushima Straits, the Japanese, a naval um, tactic called crossing the T, they lined up their ships crossways, which means only the front ship of the Russians could fire. All of the Japanese ships could fire on the Russian uh, line at the same time. The Japanese destroyed the second Russian fleet to a ship. None of them were left. So now, little Japan, has the, the little yellow monkeys, as Tsar Nicholas called them, have defeated two of the three major fleets of one of the great world powers at that time, the Russians. Tsar Nicholas is beside himself. It was, and some of this, um, I said this is the most important forgotten war, some of this, as well as their involvement in the First World War, of course, led to the fall of the uh, Russian Empire, and then later the rise of, of uh, Soviet Communism, of course. So this, I mean, this was a huge deal. At this point, the American president, Teddy Roosevelt, volunteered to mediate peace between Russia and Japan. And Russia felt like, who had good relations with the U.S. at that point, they felt like this was one way to sort of save a little face. Teddy Roosevelt got a Nobel Prize for mediating this peace, but he wasn't quite fair about it, to be honest, although, I, I, you know, I'm a great fan of Teddy Roosevelt. He insisted, as he mediated the peace agreement between the Russians and Japanese, that the Japanese had no right to claim reparation. It would, the way it was done back then was if two countries fought, the one that won got paid the expenses that were at least that, and sometimes sort of an additional penalty, for the cost of the war. And yet Teddy Roosevelt, as the moderator of this peace agreement, said, or mediator, said Russia didn't have to pay any reparations. And Japan was very angry at the U.S. about this. And some of these feelings led to the sides that people chose in the First World War and may have really affected some of what happened in the Second World War. Because, for instance, Russia 
believed that Germany had been in support of Japan during this, this Russo-Japanese War. And that's one of the reasons that they were very quick to side against Germany in the First World War, because they still had hard feelings about all of that a, few, a number of years later. So um, these two victories against first China in the First Sino-Japanese War, and then against Russia in the Russo-Japanese War, greatly improved Japan's confidence and their morale. They saw themselves now as being able to compete on the world stage with the Western powers as well. Well, because they had defeated the Russians, the Russians withdrew from the Laikon Peninsula and from Manchuria, and um, the Japanese began to develop this area that they now had control over. And Japan, remember, is, is staggering and not, not able to do very much at this point. And, very shortly after that war, the Japanese, uh, the Chinese Qing Empire fell. Um, but the Russians had started building railroads in Manchuria, down to the Laitung Peninsula. The Japanese took those railroads over and extended them and created a corporation called the South Manchuria Railway Corporation. Over the next 20 or 30 years, that South Manchuria Railway Corporation um, not only expanded the railway system, but they also got into mines and ports and various other major uh, investments, they became the largest corporation, largest financial corporation in all of Asia. And the Japanese own it and are running it on Chinese soil. Well, eventually the Japanese got tired of investing all this time and energy into uh, a land, an area that wasn't theirs. They had brought in a lot of managers from Japan. Most of the everyday workers on these various projects of the South Manchurian Railway were either Chinese or they were Koreans. But all of the managers were Japanese. And so a larger and larger Japanese population was now existing in Manchuria. And so in 1931, uh, the Japanese decided it's time for us to stop playing around with this and make this part of, our, uh, of, ja of Japan. And so they created an incident um, that they had a lieutenant in the Japanese Imperial uh, Army uh, set off an explosion near to the rail line. It didn't do any damage. In fact, they say that a, a train came through a few minutes later. But this explosion was used by the Japanese as a pretext to send in their military, saying that there were Chinese rebels or Chinese you know, dissidents that were trying to destroy the Japanese railway system, and they had a right to defend it. So they sent in troops. This is called the Mukden incident, or sometimes the Manchurian incident. They sent in troops, and in very short order in 1931, they declared that Manchuria was now a puppet, um, oops, sorry, was now a, a, a new nation called Manchuko, which was a puppet regime of Japan. No longer Manchuria, no longer part of China. In fact, they went so far as the, um, in 1911, the emperor of the Qing dynasty in China had stepped down. Well, the Qing dynasty was Manchurian. They were Yurkins from Manchuria. And so Pu Yi, the emperor that stepped down in 1911, was from Manchuria. So in order to give it sort of a gloss of credibility, the Japanese actually brought him to Manchuko and named him the emperor of Manchuko, since this previously had been Manchuria, where his family had come from. So now we have this Japanese puppet state has taken over part of the northeastern part of uh, China. The, um, the League of Nations existed then, and the League of Nations thought this was unacceptable. They sent in a commission called the Lytton Commission. They did a study and reported that all of this was falsified. The Japanese had created a pretext in order to be able to march in there and take over this land. So the League of Nations in 1932 ordered Japan to leave China. And Japan thumbed their nose at them, and in 1933, they left the League of Nations, which meant there now was no official membership of Japan in any international body that could in any way even suggest control. And so the Western powers started taking more and more responsibility um, after 1933 to pressure Japan to, to try to get them to leave China. Um, that involved embargoes, that involved cutting off oil supply from various countries, and the United States was one of the major sources for those kinds of, of controls. As a result of that, um, Japan began to feel as though, with oil, uh, much of their oil supply cut off by embargoes, that they need to do something in order to um, 
ensure that they still had access to the resources they thought were necessary for their survival. And so in 1937, July of 1937, they created another incident called the Marco Polo Bridge Incident in which they um, again declared that uh, they got into a minor conflict with China, which Japan um, blew up into a major conflict, and they declared war once again in 1937. Japan declared war against China. This is the second Sino-Japanese War. And in addition to already controlling all of Korea and all of Manchuria, um, which they called Manchuko, they ended up uh, moving down, taking over Inner Mongolia, many of the major cities, Changdao, uh, Beijing, which was called Peking then, and you'll notice the, the purple here, they took over every major port along the coastline. Now, they didn't have sufficient army or resources to take over all the land, but they took over all of the major cities. They ended up um, controlling the flow of resources into China to try to choke it off. Later on, they also um, ended up trying to take over areas in the south and the west in order to try to prevent resources from coming to China in that direction. Um, this, this war is sometimes called by the Chinese the 14-year war because they believe it really started in 1931. It ended when Japan was defeated in 1945, so that's the 14-year war. Most of the rest of the world sees this as an eight-year, two-month war because it began in 1937 when they declared war. This, the, um, the Japanese, the second uh, Sino-Japanese war became what was called the uh, India-Burma-China theater of the Second World War. And in many ways, this was when the Second World War started in terms of uh, the, the conflict in Asia. These are, um, this is a Japanese and a Chinese uh, propaganda posters from that period. So we end up with the Chinese occupation of Japan moving further and further down. You'll notice the ports here. Um, they took over more and more territory, and most of the major cities in uh, China are along this area in the north, north, east, and east, and then these various ports down here. During their occupation and control of China, uh, the Japanese were ruthless in many ways. Um, every country in the world has a period of time in which they have something that they need not be proud of. When I give the talk about the Opium Wars, I usually say that if anybody is British, they probably should stay in the cabins because it's not very, but the United States has the, you know, has our period of slavery and various other things. Um, but one of the worst incidents of the Chinese war against, uh, the Japanese war against China is what's now called the Rape of Nanking. Nanking had been the capital city. And the um, Chiang Kai-shek and his troops of the nationalist government had evacuated uh, Nanking and did not feel they could defend it. When the Japanese came in, they ended up, and the, and the estimates vary. Uh, there are some sort of revisionist historians who insist that it, it, this didn't happen at all or not to any extent. But there are a lot of images. There's a lot of you know, survivors that testify that up, up to 300,000 civilians were killed in Nanjing. Up to 80,000 women were raped, almost all of them killed afterwards, and there are a lot of horrific images about that. Um, this was a period of time in when the Japanese military uh, sent out what they called the Three Alls Order. Three Alls were kill all, loot all, burn all. And the Three All Order is estimated to have been responsible for 2.7 million deaths, just the, the following up on that order. In Nanking, um, they, were, they were carrying stories in the Japanese newspapers about uh, officers in the Imperial Army, Imperial Japanese Army, having a contest as to how many people they could behead with their swords. And keeping track of that and reporting it back in the newspapers, it was a horrendous time and horrendous things happening. One third of the city of Nanking was destroyed. Um, and so, again, Japan was controlling virtually all of the east major cities, all of the ports, but they were not controlling the uh, west at that point. And so eventually they ended up um, convincing, actually, the British and the French to stop shipping things in. And then later on, they took over Burma and other areas to try to prevent resources from coming in. At the same time that this is going on, we also have a civil war going on in China. 
the civil war in China was between the Communist Party of China, or the CPC under Mao Zedong, and the, uh, the Kuomintang, or the Chinese Nationalist Party under Chiang Kai-shek. This, of course, is Mao Zedong and Chiang Kai-shek. The area here, you can see the, the darker blue is the area that was controlled by the Japanese. The pink areas were still uh, controlled by the, the communists, and the other lighter blue areas here were controlled by the national government, which had been, they had taken over earlier, they were the official government. From 1930 to 1937, the communists and the nationalists, the Mao Zedong and Chiang Kai-shek's troops, were fighting each other. And then in 1937, they realized the biggest common threat was the Japanese. So from 1937 to 1945, they formed a common front to battle them. Although um, Mao Zedong and the communists were very sly about this, they sort of hung back in most areas and let the nationalist troops uh, take the greatest burden of the fighting and ended up greatly weakening the nationalist troops, which later on led, of course, as I'll mention in a second, to the, uh, the declaration of the People's Republic of China on mainland China, which is communist and still exists today. So mu much of all of this devastation and destruction was because of the Chinese desire to carve up China into various areas that they could not only control, but they could take advantage of the resources from. Of course, on August 6th, after many, many horrific battles, and after 67 major cities in Japan had been almost entirely destroyed by, by uh, firebombing, um, huge quantities. In fact, the most destructive night of bombing ever in history anywhere was Tokyo on uh, March 9th and 10th. The, it was called Operation Meeting House, in which over 100,000 people were killed uh, by conventional firebombing, if you will, and uh, 16 square miles of the city of Tokyo were destroyed. So that's more people who were killed than when the bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, at least initially. More died from injuries and radiation poisoning over the months following. But on August 6th, the decision was made to drop the first atomic bomb ever on Hiroshima. Um, two days later, the Soviet Union declares war on Japan and enters into Manchuria in order to attack Japan down through Korea. This is something that Stalin had promised the other allies, Churchill and, and FDR, that within a month of Germany being defeated, which they had been in May, then they would... Um, the Russians would, the Soviet Union would uh, join the other allies in fighting Japan. So they entered, crossed the border into Manchuria on August 8th. The next day, August 9th, the bomb was dropped in Nagasaki. On the 14th of August, just five days later, the, a recording of the Emperor's voice was played throughout Japan in which he accepted the terms of unconditional surrender. There was much opposition from that. A lot of the people felt like, um, who didn't, who were not close to the Emperor, felt it was not him, it was not his voice, because they'd never heard the Emperor's voice before, or that he'd been forced into it. And so there was initially a rebellion in the senior military in Japan, and then the junior officers, and then eventually the students tried to rebel. But all of those were quelled, and then the formal signing of the peace treaty was on September 2nd of, um, on the battleship Missouri. The Second Sino-Japanese War, which again, led into the Second World War, it's still part of the Sino-Japanese War. If, uh, if you consider the eight years, two months, and two days uh, from 1937 to 1945, 35 million dead and wounded, the vast majority of them were Chinese civilians. There were more than half the casualties in the whole Pacific theater of the war were in China. 1.1 um, million Japanese died there, and it was you know, it was a horrific kind of situation for all the countries to try to recover from. Then in August of 1949, the forces of the Communist Party of China had sufficiently defeated the nationalists that in August, Mao Zedong from Tiananmen Square um, in Beijing announced that the establishment of the People's Republic of China um, in October, um, in December, excuse me, the Republic of China forces seven million people left mainland China and went to Taiwan and declared the Republic of China, which is why still today we have two Chinas. There's the People's Republic of China, the Communist Party controlling it, and mainland, and the Republic of China on Taiwan. So this is what we 
have today. Of course, Japan is limited there, North and South Korea. We'll talk about that when we talk about the Korean War. Mainland China, and then the island of Taiwan, which is the Republic of China here. I'm going to put this up. I've explained this, right? This is the website where you can see the videos, both from, as of the, at the end of this month, we'll have all the videos from this trip and other trips uh, right now posted, but all of the other lectures I've done on 15 other cruises are on there, and that's my web, uh, my email address. Any questions about any of that? Joe always laughs when I ask that. <laughs> questions, thoughts, yes? Well, um, when the Americans uh, went into Yokohama, um, China, I mean, J Japan didn't have a lot of resources. What was in it for the Americans? Uh, obviously, they got a place to sell their products, but if you've got a country that doesn't have very many resources, how does it pay for it? Well, they, they had, uh, so why did, why did uh, Matthew Perry come in and want to trade with Japan? Well, for one thing, we didn't really know what they had. We knew it was a closed country, and they, that, but we're, we were not aware. Part of it is when you talk about trading, it's not always that you want something they have, but you want to sell them what you have. And there was a market for that there uh, in terms of the, the Japanese not having been trading uh, outside for a long time. So the idea, you know, they did have agricultural pro uh, products. They did have copper. Copper is one of the few minerals. They don't, they've almost exhausted that now, but copper is one of the few materials that they did have some quantity of. Um, and seafood, you know, the, there are a lot of things like that, that that were potential. But much of it, when, when the concern about opening a market wasn't so much to get what, what they had as to sell them what you had. That was a big issue. In fact, the opium war, with China, between China and Great Britain, was because China refused, they, there was nothing the British had that the Chinese wanted. And so in order to get Chinese tea, which is the main thing that the British wanted, they had to pay silver for it because they couldn't trade another commodity because they didn't have a commodity the Chinese wanted. Well, Britain doesn't have any silver mines. So the British were literally having to go to Mexico, buy Mexican silver and use that silver to purchase the tea, and there was a huge trade imbalance involved in that. We'll talk about that when we talk about OB Wars. Other questions? Yes. Right. How were they able to modernize that fast and create a military that could defeat Western powers? Well, part of it was. Um, the emperor had absolute control, you know, so the, the dictatorship may not be the friendliest uh, kind of government, but it's very efficient. And so he was able to dedicate the resources, and that was a huge commitment that he had to it. And people often will ask the question, well, if they didn't have any resources, how did they get from nothing to, you know, being a major power? Well, how does somebody with $100 in their pocket start a business that makes, you know, in, in 20 years is worth millions? Uh, it's a very similar process. You start, and the Japanese were very smart. They started with what they had. They began to trade for that. Some of it was they would make promises. You know, um, their relationship with France, for instance, some of the vessels and things, the understanding was that you help us take the next step up and you will have benefits of special, you know, like uh, favored nation trading in the future. Uh, favored nation means that, that anything anybody else gets, you get it too. And so um, basically they just step at a time and in, in 20 to 30 years, they were able to create a military. Um, and again, they didn't, even then, they didn't have the steel to start a major ship development industry, but they were able to develop the resources to buy them. Mostly it was French uh, battleships that they were buying, which were, and, and the approach they took was, was a particular military approach where they were looking for smaller vessels that were faster and more maneuverable, but still had large guns on them. So they weren't looking for large battleships, more like pocket battleships and that kind of thing. So they had a very, very specific, very smart uh, strategy for doing that. Yes? I, I noticed that in an early map you showed, Japan didn't include Hokkaido, and then later it does. And, and I recall seeing something in, I think it was in the Northern People's Magazine, where it said they went into Hokkaido partly to keep the Russians from going into there. Yeah. And uh, and also that that had gold. Yeah, here, uh, Hokkaido is included, there. But one of the things that happened is, uh, you'll notice southern Sakhalin, 
1905 was when the Japanese defeated the Russians, and they gave Southern Sakhalin uh, to to Japan as part of their, you know, the Japanese victory. And so, um, and then the Kura Islands also have always been kind of uh, questioned. But the Sakhalin uh, Peninsula that comes down here, I'm not even sure if it's connected or not, I think it is, um, it has always been an, an issue of uh, disagreement between Russia and Japan. But they ceded part of it to Japan, and then there have been questions about that later. Uh, so it's a very confusing. This whole area has had a lot of back and forth. Taiwan belonged to China, then it belonged to um, to Japan, then it belonged to China again, and now it's independent as the Republic of China. So lots of bouncing back and forth. Uh, other questions? Yes. One more. Uh, how come the Soviet Union did not end up with Mongolia and Manchuria? It would seem to be during the uh, very aggressive period that the Russians had that that would have been logical uh, annexations. Well. Uh, so why didn't the Russians end up, you're thinking after the Second World War, why didn't they end yeah. up uh, with Mongolia and uh, Manchuria? Well, the reason is because China, they had supported Mao Zedong and the Communist Party in China. They wanted to encourage the Communist Party in China. And so they were not inclined to try to take property away from the, ne the next largest, uh, actually the largest by population, Chinese um, Stalinist government in the world, and so they did not try to control the areas. They, they gave them back to China when it was all over because they were allies at that point. Later on, that's gone back and forth, but they, you know, they were clearly, um, Mao and uh, was looking to Stalin for a lot of support, and Stalin honored that, at least so far as they didn't keep those properties. <laughs> Thank you all very much. This afternoon at five o'clock, we will fill in some of the blanks with the Pacific War. Have a good day.